Janome. Hi, I'm Jessica Vandenberg and I'm a Janome maker. In this four part video series, I'm gonna walk you step by step through making my market tote. It's a quick and easy, simple bag, perfect for a beginner. I'll teach you how to make handles, how to make an outside pocket, what boxing your corners means, how to use a pressing clapper, and some of my other favorite bag making tools. I made this sample using some pretty canvas, but I also have some cork options. The pattern includes cutting sizes for cork, as well as some information in the video to help you for your first cork bag. Here's two that I've added the optional embroidery part to. Aren't they great? These were built-in designs using my Janome Horizon 15,000. So I hope you'll stay tuned, follow through, and if you have any questions, you can always contact me. I can't wait to see your market tote. So let's talk about some basic bag making supplies. I brought with me a lot of these supplies that I use every time I make a bag, whether it's a simple tote like we're going to make today or a more complex bag. So we'll just start over here in no particular order. I always have lots of clips. These are just little binding clips. You can find them in different colors, different sizes. You'll find them in different packs. I love this size, the small one, and then I also have one that's a little bit larger. I always keep plenty of these around because bags are gonna get thick, so this will definitely help to hold those layers. I also have my rulers, my rotary cutter, and my mat. These are really basic supplies that I use while I'm quilting, and I also use those for bag making. I like to be able to trim my pieces easily. I use my mat and my ruler for measuring, and I do most of my cutting with my rotary cutter. When I'm not using that, I will be using scissors, and I always keep a few pairs of scissors around. So I have these right here that are nice and sharp to the point. This is great for any time that I am cutting thicker layers or I'm cutting for hardware. They're really sturdy, sharp to the point, and the rubber handle is soft on my hands, so it's not hard using these. I also keep a pair that's small like this. I use this for embroidery and also for snipping any tiny little threads. I like to snip my threads as I go so that I'm not accumulating uh, more things for me to do at the end. So anytime I have any little loose threads, I will go ahead and cut them as I'm working. Other things that I like to have around is obviously a seam ripper and a marking tool. And I use this tool as well. This is a four in one tool. It has a stiletto on the end, which is great for helping to guide my fabric through my machine. It also has this soft point um, right here, which is really great for turning. There is a pocket on this bag, an optional pocket, and this is great for getting nice sharp corners. Down here is another seam ripper, a more traditional style as well as a little wooden iron. I don't use this as much for bag making, but I use this tool quite a bit. As for seam rippers, I don't always use traditional seam rippers. Sometimes with bag making, because of the thicker interface layers, I like a scalpel style seam ripper. I know this is a little bit frightening, so you don't have to use this, but I like this. And I also like this newer kind, um, which is also kind of a serrated edge. It really cuts nicely if you are um, unhappy with top stitching and you need to take anything out. So I keep a couple of seam rippers around because let's face it, I'm gonna make a mistake somewhere. So I will be humble about that and keep my seam rippers on hand. As for marking tools, a lot of times I will use a regular pen depending on what I'm marking. Uh, for this bag, any marking that I do, I would prefer to use something that's removable and light. This is a chalk pencil. This one happens to be green. It all depends on the color of your fabric. I'll use this when I'm doing handles on the cork pieces. I always keep pins around. Um, these are the magic pins. I really like them. They're nice and comfortable on my hands. They're easy to get in and out. I use those for fabric and mostly clips for cork. As far as thread is concerned, with bag making, I like to use cotton thread. I know a lot of bag makers would disagree with that and like to use polyester. It's really a personal choice, but I find that my cotton holds up really well. I prefer Aurifil thread. The green spool I have right here is a 40 weight. I love 40 weight for piecing as well as for top stitching. On this bag today, I'm going to be doing some embroidery. So I brought some of my fun uh, 50 weight. So these are also cotton. These are great for embroidery. And I just picked out some fun colors to go with the piece of cork that I'll be embroidering on. Um, so, you know, you can use really anything that you like. Again, I prefer cotton, some bag makers prefer polyester. Polyester is a little bit stronger, but I just like the feel and the look of cotton. Some optional tools. I always have my fabric fusion around. 
This is something that I would use on my handles when I make cork handles if I want to finish those edges. Sometimes the way that they're folded, you will have a raw edge. Um, and I'll show you a couple of different ways that you can fold your handles when we get to that step. This is great for sealing those edges so that you don't have any fraying. And when it comes to fraying, it's not the cork that frays, it's actually the cotton backing because your cork has a fabric backing on it. And we will talk a little bit about cork as well. So when I make a handle um, or I have anything with a raw edge, I like to seal my edges. This is totally optional, you don't have to. I spent many years not doing that. You can also use edge paint, which a lot of bag makers like to use. I will show you how I like to use this for my handles. This right here is a pressing clapper. And some of you might have this if you were ever um, into um, dressmaking of any kind. This is more of a dressmaker's tool. So I like to use this for my seams, especially on cork when they get kind of thick, it helps to weight them down. I also use this for my decor bond, which is my fusible interfacing. That is only going to be on the cotton pieces, but sometimes you'll get a little bit of wrinkling or bubbling. The pressing clapper helps a lot with that and I'll show you how I use that as well. Now, when it comes to feet, I brought a few of my favorites here that I use for bag making. So there is going to be a portion of this bag that I do some embroidery on. And if you don't have an embroidery machine or if you're not interested, you can absolutely skip that part. But since I am embroidering on my Janome 15,000, I have my P foot. This is my embroidery foot right here. So that I will be using later. As for my piecing part, I use a couple of different feet. So I have here two different quarter inch feet. I have a blind hem foot and I also have a clear foot. And I'll show you how I use each of those. So when it comes to my seams, all of my seam allowances are a quarter of an inch. So I will go back and forth between these feet. It kind of just depends on where I'm sewing and this applies to all bag making. This quarter inch foot, I really like because it's heavy since it's metal. But if you'll notice here, this part is a little bit wide, the part that's going to sit on the fabric. For most of my piecing, that's fine. If I'm making a bag, say for instance, that has a zipper or has a piece of hardware, this might be a little bit too wide over here and it might not get me close enough. So I'll switch to this foot. It's a little bit more narrow on that side, still a quarter of an inch, and this has a center hole where this one is a little bit more adjustable. So I can do a scant quarter or a wider quarter. They both have a flange. I like feet that have a guide on them. There's also this foot right here, which is my F. This is my open toe foot. Um, this is a clear foot. It's great for any decorative stitching. If you wanna do some decorative um, stitches on your handles or anywhere else on the bag, let's say that you don't have an embroidery machine and you wanna do some fun stitches. Your machines have so many built in, you can absolutely use something like this. This is also good if I need to do a quarter of an inch and I need to see where I'm sewing. So that is my F foot and I forgot to tell you this is my O foot and this is my OM. So these are quarter inch, this is an open toe foot. And the other foot that I use all the time when I'm sewing is my G foot. Now this is a blind hem foot. However, that is not what I use it for. This foot, which has this guide in the center here, is awesome for making an eighth inch seam. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll move my needle as far left as it goes and I will use this foot and run it right along the edge of my handle and I get a beautiful eighth inch top stitching. And I'll show you when we get to the handles how I use this. I absolutely adore this foot. I can't sew without it. So let's go ahead and talk about materials. So let's talk a little bit about materials. When it comes to bag making, we're very fortunate that we have a lot of options. We have canvases, cottons, corks, and, and so much more. There's leathers and vinyls and so many different options. But I know that that can make it very overwhelming. Where do you start? How do you know what is going to be good for a bag? How do you know what kind of interfacing to buy? So what I do is I try to break my bags down and make them very simple. I only use one kind of interfacing. So let's go ahead and start with that. I don't like to make a bag that has several different kinds of interfacing. It's not how I write my patterns. And I like my bags to have a certain feel to them. Now, I understand that this might not be ideal for everybody. Some of you might want a stiffer bag. Some of you might want a puffier or thicker bag. I like my bags to be a little bit thinner and I like them to have some stiffness but not be so stiff that it's hard to sew. So what we're gonna be using today, only on our cotton pieces, this will not be used on the cork, 
is Pelon de Corbond. This is number 809. I've used this for many years and I know that there's a lot of people that have struggled with this because it's a fusible and it's a non-woven, which means it is not cotton. It is made out of polyester. Uh, some people have struggled with the thickness of this, which personally I don't find super thick, but they've also had some issues with getting it to stick and getting it to not bubble and wrinkle. And I have some great ironing tips for you that I will share on what I have found over the years. I have probably been using Decor Bond, if I'm guessing, for maybe 15 years, if not longer, and I have just found some workarounds on how I can make it work for me. Now, I can use this on cork. I do use it on the back of cork sometimes. In today's project, I'm not going to be using it, but I will on my canvas as well as my cotton batik that I have here. So when it comes to interfacing, you're going to find so many different options out there. You're gonna find really thin ones. You're gonna find medium weights, which I would consider decor bond. You'll find some heavier, some thicker ones, fusible fleeces, cotton-based, non-wovens. It's very, very overwhelming, but what I say is first, stick to whatever the pattern designer has recommended. And for today, this is what I'm recommending. Stick with what they've told you because they have made sure that that decision works for that bag. They've told you exactly how they've made it so that you can be successful as well. And as you get into bag making, you might find different um, you know, pieces and things that you like better than others, and that's totally fine. It's always okay to make it personal and to change it to your needs. My magic solution has always been this, and if I need something firmer or a little bit stiffer, I will go to Decoville Light or I will add fusible fleece. And that's just some of the things that I personally like to use that I found success with. So this is what we'll be using today. As far as materials, let's talk a little bit about, about the cottons first and then we'll get into cork because cork is kind of a whole beast in itself. So when it comes to cotton fabrics, I do a lot of my shopping right at the local quilt shop. And what I'm gonna find at the local quilt shop are quilt based um, fabrics. So this right here is a batik. Batiks are a little bit thinner. They are a little bit tighter weave, but they're absolutely fine to use in bags. I'm gonna be using this cream color as my lining. None of my linings are really bright and fancy because I'm kind of sticking to that for the outside of the bag. You can be very creative and you know really express yourself with your linings as well. Today, I'm gonna to be kind of plain, and most of the time I kind of am. I stick with batiks. Sometimes I will do like a tone on tone, uh, something that's like a, a not a bold print, Sometimes I will also go with the Essex linens. Those are a linen cotton blend. I like those as well. For today, I'm going to be using this. And this will also get some interfacing. What I have here for the outside of one of my bags is a cotton canvas. So this is gonna be a little bit heavier than your normal quilting weight cottons, but not so heavy that it won't work for you. You can still fold it for your handles. You can still sew it and top stitch it. It works really nicely, but it gives you a little bit more weight. And I think it gives you a little bit more like higher end professional finish to your bag. I love these canvases. I use a ton of them in my bag making and they mix really nicely with cork as well. So for this particular bag, I'm gonna be just using this canvas for the outside and the handles. My batik on the inside, I won't be mixing any cork in. Now, when it comes to cork, this is where you can get a little bit overwhelmed. So just a quick history on cork. It is still fairly new here. I have been selling it and using it for approximately five years or so. The cork that I sell and that I use, I refer to often as cork leather. And the reason is, it's more of a leather substitute than it is a thin cork. When you hear the word cork, you're probably thinking cork board or wine cork that tend to be crumbly and they fall apart. That is not the case here. There are going to be some corks out there, some cork fabric that you might find online or at some of the box stores, or even sometimes at your local quilt shop that isn't the same quality, just be cautious of what you're buying. If you check out my YouTube channel, um, there's a few cork talks that I've done that will kind of give you some insight into what to look for. Um, but for today, I'll just get into that kind of briefly. So these are all corks that I use that I sell and they are a thicker cork. They're approximately um, 0.8 millimeters. They have a cotton polyester backing. Each one looks a little bit different. This one's a little bit darker. These are lighter. Some of them have a black backing like this one right here. It depends on the color that's on the front. 
They come in prints. They come in solids. This one has some texture to it. This one does not. This one has a little bit of metallic. And what I like about this cork is I can iron it. I can stitch on it. It's not sticky like a vinyl, so I don't use my Teflon foot. It sews through my machine really easily and I get beautiful results. I have ironed all of these. Um, I know that might be a little bit frightening because if you've used any kind of leather or vinyl, you might think, well, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't iron that. Where should I iron it? You can absolutely iron on the backside. I do iron on the front often as well. Again, these are the corks that I sell, that I promote, and I know that they are good, high quality. Be careful if you have any corks that are thinner, they might not iron as well. And what you don't want to happen is putting a hot iron on and having a wrinkle. I can only stand for the ones that I know. All of these are imported directly from Portugal. Portugal is the biggest distributor of cork. It's from the bark of the cork oak tree. They take the bark off, they process it in thin layers, they make it into all these beautiful corks. There's so many to choose from. It is not harmful. The tree does regenerate after about nine years or so. So it's a very environmentally friendly, vegan-based product. Great substitution for leather or vinyl. Vinyls are great, but they can be a little sticky and hard to work with, especially if you're new and not used to them. So you'll definitely need a Teflon foot. Leathers, again, are not so environmentally friendly. If you are a vegan or vegetarian, it's not gonna be your first choice. And they can also be very hard to get the right um, thickness. Some of your leathers are gonna be so thick that it's really hard to sew with unless you have a lot of experience. The thinner ones are not always as easy to find and they are kind of pricey. Cork is gonna be in between the vinyl range and leather range. It's usually priced um, closer to leather, but um, a little bit less and usually more than vinyl. So these are some of the ones that I'm using today. And as far as color choices, I know that that can also be overwhelming. So how do you choose your colors? How do you decide? Well, for this bag right here, that I'm going to make, I didn't want to make a lot of decisions. I wanted to keep it simple. I absolutely love this print. I think it's so pretty. I could have picked some of the colors that are in here and added some cork for my handles or added some different fabrics. I wanted to just let this fabric speak for itself. So I'm using just one fabric for the entire outside, the pocket, the handles, everything. And I'll add in this cream colored lining. I'm using this batik for all of my linings just to keep it simple for myself. So that's an easy way to go. Find one fabric that you absolutely love and just keep it simple. This bag, you can do a slightly larger scale. This is kind of a medium scale fabric, but it's so pretty. I didn't really want to mess with it. I wanted to kind of leave that alone. For this one right here, I'm actually doing the polka dots as the main part of my bag. I'm gonna use this textured magenta color for my pocket for a little punch. And then I decided to go with a different pink for my handles. So mine's gonna look a little bit different. I didn't do the same pinks because first of all, I didn't have enough of either to do both pieces. So sometimes you have to be creative. I also liked both the pinks together. And if you don't, that's okay. Pick one pink and do your handles in your pocket or do the entire thing out of one printed cork. Now for this one, I'm gonna piece this together and do the pieced option, which is in your pattern. And I pulled this floral first because I really like the colors in here. It's soft, but still bright. And it's got a little traditional look, but it's kind of modern. There was just something that really appealed to me about this one. It's got some pretty oranges and some salmon colors, but this teal was speaking to me. And I do have a plain teal that I could have used that would have looked just as nice, but I wanted a little bit of bling on this one. I wanted to go with uh, some metallic finish. So I picked these two. I'm just gonna alternate them, and then I'm going to use one of them for my handles, and again, a really simple lining, and just keep it like that. So this only required that I had to pick out two things. You don't have to make your bag super complex unless that's your style. If you want to do the piece look and you want to use six different colors on the front of your bag, go for it. What I usually do is start with one print and I'll go from there and kind of pick out colors. And here's a fun tip. Even if you don't want to use this print, even if you just like the colors, you can take this, pick out some orange, some uh, pinks and salmon, some blues, some of these darker colors. Use this as your inspiration, but don't use it in the bag. Just use those solid colors. Because if you like this look, but the flowers, 
they're not really your thing, you can pull the inspiration from that. For this one, it's so na um, neutral with just the black and the natural color. I could have stuck with a black handle. I could have gone with a natural. I could have done all polka dots. I wanted a little pop of color. And it's if you think about quilting, if you're a quilter, you've seen over the years a lot of black and white quilts that have that pop of color. This is kind of my version of that. So instead of doing a black and white and a red, I'm going with a natural and black and some pink. There's so many different options, so many things that you can do. Let bag making be fun. Don't be super overwhelmed by all your choices. That's probably the best tip that I can give you. So let's get into all of our pieces and start putting this bag together. For the outside of my bag, I have the option of using one solid piece of fabric or cork, or I can piece it together. So I'm going to go ahead and piece this one. What I've done is I've cut 12 total pieces. I have six of my print, six of my metallic, and I'm just gonna start sewing these together in pairs. So I have six pieces for the front and I have six on the um, set aside here for the back. So I'm gonna go ahead and sew these together using a quarter of an inch seam. Once I have them sewn into pairs, I'm just gonna sew them together. That way I have six total pieces and I'm going to press all of my seams open and then I'm going to top stitch. I like to top stitch about an eighth of an inch. That way it keeps my seams nice and flat. So I'm gonna take this to my sewing machine and sew together my half for the front and my other half for the back. I have some great ironing tips for you that are going to help for your fabric pieces to adhere to your fusible interfacing. So the first thing that I always do is I put my fusible interfacing with the shiny side up. So this is the fusible side. I put that on my ironing surface. Then I take my fabric and I put it wrong side down. And I'll just kind of scoot this over until I get it where it needs to be. Now that this is in place, I'm going to use a hot iron this iron does have steam. It's set on my linen setting, which is the hottest setting I have. And I do have my steam turned up and I'm just gonna work my way around. Some people will um, count or ask, you know, how, how many seconds do I hold this? I don't do that. And I'm also not pushing really hard. I'm very, very lightly moving my iron around. I'm just kind of working a little bit in the corners, coming back, working down here and you know move your fabric if you need to i try to keep my iron off of the interfacing if i can if i'm having a spot that doesn't want to adhere and i want to turn this over and iron from the fabric side or from the interfacing side excuse me um what i find happens is i get more wrinkles that way so i like to just stick to the fabric side now as i'm ironing if i find that i am having a spot that doesn't want to stick or if i get any wrinkling that's when I use my pressing clapper. And what I'll do is either hold it on here, leave that uh, sitting so that the weight can help to flatten everything out if I have a wrinkle, or if I'm having a spot that's being difficult, I can kind of move it around gently, just like this. And by using the pressing clapper, it's absorbing the heat from my iron. So my piece of fabric is warm, but my pressing clapper is also warm as well. And it's helping to smooth everything out. And I'll work around in the corners, work my pieces, I do find that fabric like this, this canvas is a little bit heavier. It doesn't have as much of a problem with adhering to the interfacing, and it also doesn't uh, wrinkle as much and pucker. Some of your lighter weight fabrics might do that, but if you try using the pressing clapper, I find that it helps a lot. I will be honest with you, 
The interfacing itself comes with some instructions that I have not found to be really great. It tells you to use a damp pressing cloth. It tells you what settings to put your iron on. And I've just found that those don't work for me. So if you want to stick to the instructions by all means, but I have found that a hot steam iron, no pressing cloth, ironing as little if at all on the interfacing and using a pressing clapper when needed, that really works for me. So this piece is adhered. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this over and I'm gonna grab one of my fabric handles so I can show you how you're going to adhere this. So let's get rid of what we don't need here. So when it comes to the interfacing, the interfacing is short. It is two inches shorter than my fabric. So I'm just kind of eyeballing this. You can totally use a ruler if you want to, but I don't find it necessary. And that looks like it's about an inch to me. So then I'm just gonna work this down so I can see where it's gonna sit on here and down here. There we go. So it's pretty even. Now I'm gonna turn this over and I'm not gonna worry if that inch is perfect on each end because it really doesn't matter. It's just to eliminate some of the bulk in your seam allowance and down towards the bottom. So as long as you don't have interfacing all the way to the ends, you will be fine. And now you can see. So I probably didn't do the best job cutting and I'm a little bit off. I'm probably closer to a half inch instead of an inch, but that's okay. It's totally fine. I'm just gonna keep ironing until I get all the way to the end. And you'll notice I have some you know, wrinkles in my fabric. I don't iron them out first because I'm just gonna iron it onto my interfacing. So I'm just kind of taking my time, working a little section at a time as I go, use my pressing clapper if I need, keep straightening this out. And here's another little tip that I found is very helpful. If you are not a super accurate cutter, it happens, trust me, it happens to everybody. But if you want, you can actually cut your interfacing intentionally shorter than it needs to be. So for this piece, it needs to be four inches wide. So what I'll do is put my ruler on my interfacing and then scoot it just a little bit, maybe about an eighth of an inch or so. And what that does is now my interfacing is short of four inches. So it's a little shy on the edges. And then when I iron this, I don't have to worry about hitting my iron onto that sticky part because there's nothing worse than going, oh shoot, I just ironed my iron to the interfacing. Now what do I do? So you can always go a little shorter. That way it's a little less bulk in your seams and less likely that you will iron the fusible onto your iron.